Hey again everybody and happy new year. Serena and her family are Chinese, so at the time I'm writing this we haven't had the Lunar New Year celebration yet. But we already have had the usual Western New Year festivities for 2022. I hope you all had a good time as well, but if you didn't, that's perfectly fine too. Regardless of what the movies and society say, you're not obligated to be happy during this time of year. I say that because I know that many people are not, and that's okay. Regardless, I hope 2022 is a good year for you. For this letter, I figured that we would talk about interactions between different types of monsters, both ones that I have witnessed and ones that other people have. It's a fascinating topic, and one that you guys showed some interest in when I asked about it last time. Thanks for all of your responses, by the way, because I always enjoy those. Before we get started, I want to give a quick PSA. I'm about to get a little preachy, and it may sound silly, so get ready. But I would really like you to listen, because I think this is important. I've seen some information floating around out there about people who have been deciding to go on monster hunts of their own. I'm referring to non-hunters. Well, they may be hunters in the traditional sense, but my organization is the capital H Hunters, and as most of you probably know, we are very much a different thing. It feels a bit silly, but it also feels sort of important for me to say that you really, really should not be trying to go after any sort of cryptid on your own. Doing so can be extremely dangerous. Even small things like an infection or a broken ankle can be fatal in the wild. So of course the claws or teeth or missiles of a monster are even more lethal. There is a lot of misinformation out there, and as my family and I have often told rookie hunters, even if you think you're ready to start this line of work, you may very well not be. It requires immense preparation, training, and knowledge. And, probably often, being a hunter entails a lot of damn difficult and terrifying and treacherous and heartbreaking work. Hopefully, you've realized this if you've been listening to my letters. The name hunters come from an older time and a Euro-American culture that was mostly concerned simply with killing monsters, rather than learning how to live and deal with them. But in my family's history, and for many more hunters nowadays, it's clear that being a hunter is just as much about preserving life as it is about dealing death. We must work on both sides of the coin, and hopefully my letters have made this clear too. Informing you is part of my goal with writing these, and I say all this to request that you guys please, please, please don't put yourself in harm's way. Anyways, I'll get off my soapbox now. Hopefully that didn't sound too ridiculously pretentious. I just wanted to put my thoughts on the subject out there, because I've seen a lot of misinformation about this stuff, and I really want you guys to be safe. On that note, I also feel like it's important to acknowledge that yet again, that the support you've shown both me and my letters is just wonderful, and I'm beyond appreciative. Speaking of support, one of my biggest supporters in both these letters and my personal life is my incredible girlfriend Serena, who is telling me right now that I should write this, that she is, and I quote, a rock star of a human being. And she is. She's also reminding me that the Monsters Around the World segments that I used to do back in the first round of these letters, for those who do not know or remember, this was a section after the Q&A where I took a country or a region that someone asked about in the comments and gave a brief rundown of some of the cryptids that could be found there. That idea usually seemed to be very well received, so now Serena and I are wondering if I should bring it back. I also briefly experimented with another post Q&A section where I gave brief overviews of monsters that people asked about, so maybe I could revive that as well. Please let me know down in the comments if you'd like to see either of those segments make a return in the future. I don't have as much of a structure for this second round of letters as much as the first, so a lot of it is up in the air, and the more specific input you guys give, the more I'll know how to tailor my letters to you. I obviously can't answer everything, but I can give it a good old college try. Anyway, with all the housekeeping type stuff out of the way, let's get into the rest of this letter. I'm going to take a break from the normal format of these letters this time, because I'm not going to do a Q&A section for this one. I'm planning on making the next letter, or maybe the one after that, into one huge Q&A, 
so I'm saving some material for then. On that note, keep the questions coming in the comments if you like this idea. As usual, pretty much anything goes. Feel free to throw out any questions or concerns you might have, even if you just want me to clarify or elaborate on something I've said in the past. Hell, even if you want to know something that has nothing to do with cryptids, I'm more than happy to try and answer for you. I love the silly or fun questions as well as the serious ones. For now, let's just get started on the main topic of this letter, which is interactions between monsters. If you've listened to my previous letters, I've talked about several cryptid interactions already. For example, in my Dogman letter I spoke about how I helped the mother Sasquatch and her child fight off a Dogman. Back when I forgot to mention the fact that the day afterwards I found a special gift waiting for me on my doorstep. Twelve smooth river pebbles, arranged in a perfect circle on the doormat. I suppose the Sasquatches had left them there as a thank you, and I still have those pebbles in a box at home somewhere. I've also talked about how we witnessed a clash between a dogman and a pack of chupacabras in the so-called Battle of the Long Grass, as we jokingly named it. And of course, in my last letter I discussed relations between a family of vampires and a family of fairies. My nephew has witnessed some of the more magical or supernatural elements of fairies, so to speak, but during the case I'm referring to here, I just saw some of the more human-like aspects, so to speak. I've been fortunate enough to see a wide variety of monsters throughout my career, including witnessing them meet with each other. Two of the stories that I'll be relating here are from other hunters though, both classic and modern. Sergio provided me with multiple sources when I asked him for some help on the topic of this letter, so I'm kind of crowdsourcing information here to give you guys a broader range of experiences other than just my own. This is my first time taking this kind of approach so let me know how it goes over with you in the comments. If you don't like it, I can go back to just telling you about my own experiences. But, even for this letter, don't worry too much. I'll drop in the usual personal stories of my own throughout it. I could go on and on about cryptid interactions forever, but here are some ones that I think you'll find interesting. First, I'll restate that monsters come in all shapes and sizes, and levels of intelligence. Some are more animalistic, such as the Dean Gonek, while others like fairies are as smart as humans, or even smarter. Second, monsters have all sorts of social structures, some are solitary and some live in groups. What these facts mean is that interactions between cryptids take all forms, in all sorts of places, at all sorts of times. Not everything is a fight, but a lot of times conflict is the result when different monsters encounter each other. I've seen a few of these myself. Let's start with one of the more intense monster on monster encounters that I've witnessed. This was when Heather and I were in Libya with a friend of hers named Malik, who she knew from before she met me. Malik is from Tunisia and he specializes in dealing with desert dwelling cryptids. In case you weren't aware, much of North Africa is made up of vast tracts of desert, mainly the Sahara. Malik has a particular interest in carnivores, of which there are a few in the Sahara Desert. Two of these are the Ajule and the Krakata. I won't go into a ton of detail here because this letter isn't really about just these two monsters, but here's a quick rundown on both species to help you understand them. Ajule are relatives of African wild dogs, which are beautiful wolf-like canines that live in parts of that continent. If you're not aware of what an African wild dog looks like, I highly recommend a quick Google search. They have gorgeous coats of fur and are unique and incredible animals. Ajule are close relatives of theirs, and Malik believes that they share a close common ancestor. Much like humans and chimpanzees, Ajule look a bit like a cross between African wild dogs and wolves. They are around two and a half feet tall with tall, pointy ears and short fur that ranges in color from tan or golden to reddish orange or medium brown. Part of the reason why they are considered cryptids is that they're often mistaken for very oversized jackals or foxes. Like many other canines, Ajule are social creatures, living in mated pairs or packs of up to 12 members. They have a surprisingly wide diet, as they will eat almost anything and equally wide home ranges, which can cover many square miles. 
They defend the cores of these ranges as territories, and this is one reason why Heather, Malik, and I were able to witness the conflict that I'm about to describe. When we were in Libya with Malik, we saw what I can only describe as a battle between a pack of Ajule and a clan of another monster species known as the Krakuta. If Ajule's closest living relatives are African wild dogs, then Krakutas are easily closest to hyenas, which, by the way, are not actually canines. Krakutas are mentioned as far back as ancient Greek sources, and nowadays they can be found in North Africa. In appearance, they look like slightly larger versions of striped or spotted hyena. Krakutas have long manes that run down their spine, and a combination of black stripes and spots along their tan or brown fur of their bodies. Because of their appearance, Krakutas are often simply mistaken for striped hyenas, but they are larger and much more aggressive. Krakutas also have a weird feature in that they don't have a bunch of separate teeth. Instead, they have four fangs and some long ridges that are like single teeth. Imagine if you had one unbroken tooth that ran where your teeth are now, instead of multiple individual teeth put side by side. That's what Krakutas have, for some unknown reason. Krakutas also have the disturbing ability to mimic sounds, including human speech, almost exactly like parrots or wendigo. They live in mated pairs or clans that usually number up to nine or ten members. They are almost exclusively carnivores, and like Ajule, they have wide home ranges and defend the core areas of these as territories. On rare occasions, the territories of Ajule packs, Krokuta clans, or both, overlaps, and when this happens, it can come to blows, as we witnessed on this occasion. Both Ajule and Krokutas are primarily nocturnal, and it was about 2.30 in the morning when we saw the clash. Malik had been following an Ajule pack for probably several days at that point, and there were about eight members. He was trying to make some records and studies of their behavior and habits. When not actively dealing with actual hunts, capital H hunters will often go out into the field to do research, and this is what Malik had been up to. He had invited us to come with him into the desert to help him out, so we had taken an off-road, safari-style jeep into the Libyan desert to track down the Ajule. Malik had tagged a dominant male of the pack with a tracking ship, so it didn't take us too terribly long to find their location. We arrived at a big bluff covered in some rock formations in the late afternoon. From a distance, we could see a few of the Ajule lying in the shade on top of the rocks, peering at us with intelligent yellow and orange eyes. After staring at us for a minute or two, they put their heads down and went back to sleep although occasionally one of them would get up and pace around a bit before lying back down. Malik said that they had grown accustomed to the jeep, so they weren't bothered by our presence too much. For the rest of the afternoon, the Ajule pack lazed around. A pair of younger ones would play fight and run around from time to time. Every time they got close to one of the ones that were sleeping, they would get growled at, which was somewhat amusing. It seemed like a slow day, but a little after dusk, the pack began to stand up and move around, evidently preparing to get moving. We also got ready to start following them. They didn't seem too concerned even as the jeep started up. The Ajule came down from the rocks above us and headed off through the rocky landscape, eventually coming into a shallow valley or basin. A little brook, not much more than a trickle of water, ran through the area, and they stopped to drink at it. We pulled up on the side of the valley and turned on a spotlight that sat on the top of the jeep. We shone it on the pack, but the Ajule didn't seem to mind, because they were accustomed to it by this point. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the sound of an assault rifle firing burst through the air. The Ajule all started to scatter, and all of us humans instinctively began to duck and cover. I had no idea what was shooting, or who was shooting, where they were, and why they were. The sound stopped after a few shots, then went off again, and when it sounded the second time, I realized that it sounded off. It was very hollow and sounded softer than I would expect. 
It lacked that sort of snapping or cracking element that gunshots have. I lifted my head to see five large shapes coming down the other side of the dusty valley floor. Each had the classic hyena body shape with high shoulders and sloped backs. Long manes hung down their spines, and as I watched, the lead one lifted his head, apparently making the assault rifle sound with its mouth. What the hell? I asked, and Malik gasped from beside me. It was hard to see outside the area brightened by the spotlight, but we could see the five strange creatures coming closer. Crocutus. They're very skilled mimics. I've never seen them before. They must have moved in recently. Malik whispered. The clan of Crocutus went down to the water and started to drink, but soon we began to hear growls from outside the spotlight, and every now and then a hoarse coughing bark. The Ajule began to creep closer from beyond the periphery of the area, approaching the water slowly and cautiously, baring their teeth at the Crocutus. The Crocutus continued to drink at first, but their manes began to stand on end, making them look bigger than they really were. However, even without their mane standing up, they were still a good bit larger than the Ajule. Even if they were slightly outnumbered, the lead Crocutta snarled and made the gun sound with his mouth again. But the trick evidently was not going to work twice, because the Ajule only flinched and stopped briefly before continuing. The Ajule came into the bounds of the spotlighted area now, and they looked mad. If you've ever seen an angry dog, then you know how scary they can be. The Ajule were just as menacing, not to mention that there were eight of them. Heather, Malik, and I were in no danger, of course, but I still felt my heart racing, and I think I knew that there was going to be a fight. The Ajule got very close, and there was a standoff for a few minutes before the Crocutas started to pull back from the river. Three Ajule were loping around behind the Crocutas, while the others were closing in from the front in an arc formation. This was classic pack hunting tactics at work. One of the Ajule in the rear snuck up and was about to snap at a Crocutta when another one spotted it and rushed over to defend its clanmate. The Ajule bolted and the Crocuttas chased after it for a few yards before stopping. Having been separated from the rest of their clan, the pair of Crocuttas were now vulnerable and the Ajule seized the opportunity. All three of the Ajule that had been sneaking in from the rear now ran at the two Crocuttas that had split off from their clanmates. One Ajule snapped its jaw around the hind leg of a Crocutta, which screamed in what sounded like a humanly voice, and started to whirl around and bite at the Ajule. The second Crocutta started to run over to help its friend, but the other two Ajule had flanked it and gotten its path and started barking ferociously stopping it in its tracks. Amazingly, none of the other monsters moved much, instead just watching as one of the Crocutta grunted and snarled, spinning around as it tried to get the Ajule off its leg. Eventually, the Crocutta managed to twist in such a way that it was able to bite its attacker on the shoulder, and the Ajule abruptly let go and trotted away. If it had hands, it probably would have been dusting them off in satisfaction. Malik tells me that the bite force of Crocutta's is a great deal higher than that of the Ajule, but that didn't seem like it mattered much in this instance. The Crocutta had been bitten, and it was limping pretty badly now, bleeding across the rocks as it made its way, panting back towards its clanmates. It had only made it about halfway there before all three Ajule in the rear came running at it. They jumped on it, and some of the other Crocutta's came rushing in to help their clanmate but they were swiftly cut off by a few other of the Ajule. The Crocutta was now limping and had three Ajule on it, snapping and tearing at whatever part they could reach. Because of its injured leg, it couldn't spin around like before, and in any case, it wouldn't have been able to keep track of three enemies all at once. The Ajule kept jumping at it, and every so often the Crocutta would scream in its human male voice again, which was incredibly disturbing. After a few moments, one of the Ajule grabbed the Crocutta's uninjured hind leg, and one of them grabbed the side of its neck, and the Crocutta fell to the ground. Just then, one of its clanmates managed to essentially juke out the Ajule that was confronting it, and run over to help. The Crocutta that came to help seized one of the Ajule by the back, with its neck and its jaws, and now the Ajule was screaming, which sounded much more like a high-pitched yelp that we are used to hearing from dogs. Around this point, things became too chaotic for me to keep track of it all. 
because a few of the monsters that had so far not been fighting started to attack each other now, and that seemed to send all the others into a frenzy. Dust started kicking up everywhere, making it hard to see, and much of the fighting was taking place outside of the spotlight, so it was hard to tell exactly what was going on. The noise was awful, because all the monsters were growling and snarling, the usually were barking and banging and yipping, the Crocutta had made the gunshot noises starting up again, and some of the other Crocuttas started shouting in what I assumed was Arabic, which Malik later confirmed for me. These new vocalizations sounded angry rather than in pain like that first scream had been, and Malik later told me that they had heard of one of the Crocuttas shouting a phrase that essentially meant, get back or stay away in Arabic, which was very freaky to hear coming from a Crocutta, especially one that was in the middle of a battle. Another one was shouting one phrase of a prayer to God over and over, and we later reasoned that the Crocuttas must have heard people yelling these things directly at them to drive them off. All the Crocutta shouts were distorted and imperfect versions of original human sounds, but it was still very bizarre and wrong sounding coming from these animals. If you've ever seen animals fight, the actual combat often consists of being scarily fast and multiple strikes or bites or steps occurring in only a few seconds. It can oftentimes be impossible to keep track of exactly what's happening, and that's certainly the case here. The Crocutta had initially been brought down and was lying motionless on the ground. And nearby in a jule, maybe the one that I'd seen get grabbed was staggering away. Blood spattered the ground here and there, and every few minutes things would calm down for just a few seconds. Both the Azule and the Crocuttas would back off, literally licking their clans or pack members' wounds. They would stay apart for a while, barking and snarling and shouting at each other. Inevitably, the two groups would start creeping closer to each other and the Azule would fan out to surround the Crocuttas with their superior numbers. Usually it would be an Azule that would attack first, leaping in and taking a snap at a Crocutta. If the Azul's attack missed or if it lost its hold, then it would leap away, yipping a few times on the occasions when the attacking Azul did manage to get a grip with its jaws on the Crocutta, then multiple other Azul would come close, either to help in the attack or to keep the other Crocuttas at bay to prevent from helping their clanmate. After almost an hour of back and forth fighting, it was clear that both sides were getting tired. Two Crocuttas laid on the ground, dead or dying, and two of the surviving three were bleeding. Many of the Azule had also been wounded, and one of the pack was dead. I hadn't seen how it had gone down, but Malik and Heather told me that a Crocutta had bitten its back and shaken it, probably breaking its spine or its neck. All of the surviving monsters were visibly exhausted, and when one of the Crocuttas made a charge at the Azule lines, the pack broke and scattered away from it. With a clear path now open, the other two surviving Crocuttas followed behind the first one and went loping away across the rocks. The Azule paced around for another few moments nuzzling and licking each other before starting to make a meal out of the dead Crocuttas. They didn't eat the member of their pack that had been killed. It would be cool if the Azule did this out of respect, like honoring their dead, but because they behave like uh, any other species of dog and because they didn't quite finish eating every part of the dead Crocuttas, it's probably much more likely that they just weren't hungry enough. After that, the Azule returned to the rocks where we had first met them, and we returned to our camp for some much-needed sleep. We did a few more observation trips, but that was the most intense one. It was more like traditional animal combat than some of the other experiences I've told you about, but it was so vicious and large-scale that I figured I'd include it here. It's also a good example of how many monsters, and in fact maybe even most of them, are very much like any other animal. Of course, humans are animals too, just obviously a bit different from others in many ways. Azule and Crocuttas are good examples of more beastly cryptids. We hunters do have some loose categories or classifications for different types of monsters, including animal-like monsters, humanoid monsters, shape-shifting monsters, and more. As you may already know, I'm a big science geek, so I'll spare you the taxonomy lesson here. If you'd like to know more, feel free to ask, and maybe, and maybe I can go over it in my Q&A letter. As far as the Azule Crow Cutta fight went, it was relatively light in terms of the lasting impact it caused on the environment around it. 
The effects of it were mainly limited to the pack and the clan involved. Other monsters, however, have had much more widespread influence. In the past, I've already talked about how cryptids like Wendigo can really destabilize entire ecosystems through their actions. And there are other monsters that can cause similar or even greater levels of havoc if pushed. I've mentioned before that Eastern Europe is home to a few species of reptilian monsters. Some of these rank among the largest cryptids in the world, and could really be considered dragons. In fact, many sources, including the one I'm about to tell you, use that very term to refer to them. These are incredibly long-lived and mysterious creatures that live in and out of the way places. Most commonly, remote bodies of water or mountains. They survive off fish, birds, and other wildlife, as well as some types of plant, like crocodiles or snakes, these reptilian monsters all have very slow metabolisms and equally low levels of activity, and they rarely leave their homes. This makes them very secretive and poorly known, but when they do emerge from their hiding places, they can cause enormous problems. One of these situations occurred in Serbia in 1907. It's one of the few times that an Allah was witnessed leaving its home and moving to another place. I should note that the monster's name of Allah has no relation to the Arabic word Allah, which is the Arabic name for God. When it comes to the name of the cryptid, the plural of Allah is Alay, and Alay are fascinating cryptids. They reside in the high peaks of Eastern Europe, mainly in the different Slavic countries. Appearance-wise, Alay somewhat resemble enormous versions of the animals known as flying lizards. Check out a picture of these little guys if you're interested. Basically, Alay have long snake-like bodies, two front legs, and wing-like membranes that extend from beneath their legs and down the sides of their bodies, like a glider suit or a flying squirrel. They don't have back legs, and instead, these membranes allow them to glide for short distances. Alay heads look a little bit like crocodile heads, but with multiple horn-like spikes that extend backwards from the backs of their skulls. Alay claws are designed for gripping, and one account mentions how they use claws to traverse the rocky faces of cliffs and mountains. Although nobody in modern times has seen an Allah do this, in terms of size, Alay is huge, and although nobody has been able to measure one, the reports of a few hunters that have witnessed them say that they range between 50 and 65 feet in length and between 7 and 9 feet in height. These reports could certainly be exaggerated, but unlike many fishermen, hunters' jobs depend on us being factual, so I don't think these records are overblown, at least not intentionally. Also, we hunters all tend to get pretty good at accurately estimating measurements. Alay is a bit like Thunderbirds in that they seem to be associated with extreme weather events. We don't know if Alay is responsible for causing these events, if they follow the events around, or if they just happen to show up when the events are occurring. Whatever the reason, an Allah is almost always accompanied by enormous storms, with driving rain, thunder and lightning, and especially hail. As you may have guessed, Alay are very rare creatures and all accounts of them date from before the 1950s. This 1907 account that I'm about to share is one that the last hunter records of the species. It's well known by many hunters because it's, well, wild. You'll see. It was written down by a Croatian hunter named Philippe. He naturally wrote his journals in Croatian, but they've thankfully been translated into English. The following is my summary of these journal entries. Philippe was in Serbia trying to contact a group of Vile. The word Vile, or Vili, is the plural, and Vila is the singular. Vile are also known as Samadivi. Vile are a lot like fairies, although every Vila resembles a human and they cannot change shape. They have a lot of similarities to the mythological nymphs of other cultures including a tendency to dwell apart from human settlements in more wild places. Samadivi are intelligent and usually quite friendly towards humans, although ever since the European Industrial Revolution, they have retreated further into the areas of wilderness that are left. There's much more to say about the Vile, but for now, that's what you need to know. Our Croatian hunter, Philippe, 
was in the woods of the Rudina Mountains in Serbia, trying to develop a bond with the local Samadivi who lived there. It was well known by both the hunters and many of the human townspeople of the region that the Vili inhabited the area, and Philippe was trying to get them to trust him and let him interact with them and study them. He had been in the mountains for about two and a half months and had been somewhat successful in his goal. He had a few interactions with the Samadivi, and there he had been able to communicate with them slightly in the Serbian language. Serbian is like a sister language to Croatian, so Philippe could understand and speak it quite well. He still did not exactly know where the Valais lived, or even details of how they lived, but he had gotten a few of his questions answered. He had also shared a lot of information with them, although he couldn't be sure exactly how much of it they understood. One night, Philippe was awoken by a sudden onset of a massive storm, which he calls a tempest. He describes it as the worst storm he has ever seen, although I don't know how old he was when he was writing that. He may be blowing things out of proportion, but mountain weather can be incredibly ferocious, even when there isn't an law on the move. Philippe says that the point when he got very concerned, took his rifle, and left his tent to investigate was when a tree crashed to the ground only a short distance away. He tells us that his campsite was situated next to an open bluff looking out over the western slopes of the mountain he was on. The forested eastern side of the neighboring peak and the wooded valley between the two mountains. Because of the darkness and the downpour, Philippe couldn't see very far into the distance. However, almost immediately after he exited his tent, he saw an incredibly rapid series of thunderbolts light up the woods across from him, hitting and illuminating the eastern side of the adjacent mountain. He says he saw eight separate lightning strikes go down the mountainside in a straight line, all occurring in less than 30 seconds time. He saw trees shifting and collapsing in the exact area, but no wildfires flared up there, likely because of the torrential rain. Philippe began to suspect that something was very wrong and tells us that he was reminded of the traditional legends of the Alay. In the stories, Alay are demons, destructive and powerful, and take a variety of forms, including something that resembles the actual cryptid in the myths. Alay is often fought and defeated by other magical beings, including good dragons, dragon men, various animals, and even Christian saints. Many of these figures are said to use lightning to fight off Alay, or that lightning is the result of the battle in the sky between them. The actual monster simply travels along with the storms, and there was no sign of any dragon or saint to stop the one that Philippe imagined was heading down the neighboring mountain. At this point, he was unaware that an actual Allah was really in the vicinity. Because he only knew about these creatures from legends and fairy tales, he knew that the lightning was incredibly bizarre, but he was only reminded of the stories he had heard and thought that there was some other explanation for what he had seen. Or, maybe he just wanted there to be another explanation because the lightning, like this, is obviously not normal whatsoever. Philippe knew that being outside in a storm was unsafe, but he also knew that it would be even more dangerous to stay in his tent, which was in the woods, where a tree could fall over on him, or get struck by lightning right next to it. He doesn't say if he knew the lightning is attracted to the highest points in an area, but this is also a bit of information that makes his decision a fairly sensible one. Philippe didn't want to spend the time striking and taking down his tent, so he left it weighted down, took a canvas tarp, and laid down on the ground on the bare, open overlook next to his camp. He says that he set the tarp up sort of like a roof and pulled it taut overhead. I'm not exactly sure how he did this or exactly how this would work, he doesn't really explain it further, so we're left to imagine it for ourselves. Philippe laid under the tarp for some time more, until he saw another series of rapid lightning strikes, once again concentrated in a single localized area and further down the opposite mountainside in a line. He doesn't specify the exact number or timing of the bolts this time, probably because he was shaken by what comes afterwards. With the lightning illuminating the forest across from him, Philippe saw several trees crashing to the ground, and a horrible sound echoed across the area. Even over the rain and thunder, Philippe describes the noise as a combination of a rumble and a hiss, and I imagine 
that it may have sounded a bit like an alligator bellow, which is scary enough coming from those animals. Now imagine that a creature ten times their size was making such a noise, and you can get an idea of what Philippe was probably hearing. After he heard the sound and saw the falling trees, he noticed several animals beginning to run past him higher up the mountain he was on. Ground birds, squirrels, and a whole herd of deer passed by him, clearly terrified and all hurrying in the same direction. Away from the valley and the lightning, Philippe knew that this was probably in his best interest to follow them, but as he was beginning to get up to do so, he was instantly brought back down by a sudden, huge surge of feelings and thoughts. The way Philippe describes this is a bit hard to understand, but here's my best explanation as I understand it. Basically out of nowhere, he felt a deep and painful swell of fear and pain. He describes it as being slashed deeply by a knife. He felt scared and hurt, but as suddenly as the feelings had struck him, they were gone. They had lasted only an instant, but they were so immersive and overwhelming that he was totally crippled by them. He spent the next few moments curled up on the ground, breathing hard and crying, even though he had no idea why or where the feelings had come from. At some point, it began to hail, and the sound of sizable hailstones hitting the tarp brought Philippe back to being aware of the outside world. The wind was intensifying, but Philippe found that he couldn't move. No matter how hard he tried, he described how his legs seemed to be frozen in place like they stopped working entirely. I should note that although Philippe was a relatively new hunter, he was not completely inexperienced. So, even though he was afraid and in a totally unfamiliar situation, I'm not sure he was freezing up purely due to fear. I think the feelings that had suddenly hit him basically crippled him. You may understand why in a bit. With hail pelting down around him, Philippe laid on the ground, looking off in the darkness for the third time. Lightning bolts came snapping down in quick succession, making a line down in the valley between the mountain where Philippe was and the one to the west. As the last few flashes lit up the valley, Philippe saw an enormous shape come snaking through an open space between the trees. It was in a law slithering and using its two legs to move through the mountains. He says that he briefly caught a glimpse of it using its gliding membranes to float down the valley, and he heard smaller trees crashing down around as it came. Interestingly, Philippe mentioned seeing what looked like black smoke or wind whipping up around the Allah, and he admits that this may very well be a trick of the light. But now, he knew what he was dealing with, and he found himself fully believing in the tales of the Alay. He still felt that he couldn't move, though, and as he struggled to get to his feet, he was slammed with the same wave of emotions as before, which were now accompanied by words. Audible words came to Philippe's mind rather than his ears. He describes the voices deep with no obvious gender or age, but he got the feeling, or the sense, that the speaker was very old and clearly in a lot of pain. He says that the tone of the voice was not aggressive, but it was intense, the same way someone might call for a doctor if they or someone near them was injured. The words Philippe were able to hear were in Serbian. He first heard the word agony, then suffering, then hurt, and finally terror. He says that the words echoed in his head multiple times before they and the emotions both faded once more. Philippe felt sure that this had been the Allah crying out. Although he didn't know of it for sure, and he didn't know what to do or how to communicate with him, he still felt paralyzed and at a loss for what to do for the situation. He says that he felt like the Allah was not evil, but it obviously was being quite destructive, and he wasn't sure either how he could help it or how he could fight it. Philippe lived in a time and place where hunters were less conscious of finding peaceful solutions to situations with monsters. So he says that his instinct was to try fighting it, but no hunter has ever made a head-on battle with an Allah, and Philippe knew that his bullets would not even be a mosquito bite to the cryptid. But more than that, the Allah was a monster that scared him deeply, and that he had only ever known as a type of evil, mythological demon, and yet here one was, tearing through the forest in his direction. Philippe did the only thing he knew and felt that he could and started praying. 
I'm sure that he put his heart and soul into it. But, just like before, no dragon people or saints or eagles swooped in to the rescue. He felt completely alone, although as you'll see in a minute, he certainly was not. Still unable to move, he could hear the Allah getting closer at a surprisingly fast speed, heading in his direction. Every so often, it would give the same rumble hiss bellowing sound clearly in pain and steadily approaching him. The hailstones were getting bigger now, and lightning was cracking down in every direction directly above him. Philippe could hear and see trees falling without the illumination of the lightning at this point, and grabbed his rifle, praying all the while. Something large went fluttering and whipping past Philippe, and he realized that this, that was his tent. Having lifted and blown away by the force of the wind, he knew that he needed his shelter. He tells us that even despite his panic, he was aware that even if he survived the Allah, he did not want to die of hypothermia or exposure. As he bolted out from under his tarp to run after the tent, the forest ahead of him suddenly exploded into flames. A literal wall of fire shot up from out of nowhere, soaring about 15 feet in the air. Philippe estimates. As if this wasn't strange enough, Philippe says the color of the flames was shifting. Most of the time, they were normal oranges, reds, and yellows of an ordinary fire, but occasionally they would flash green or blue or white for the briefest of moments. And even more strangely, the fire seemed to be changing in temperature. When it initially flared up, Philippe felt a wave of heat sweep over him and his surroundings, but as soon as the fire began to produce a noticeable chill, before switching back to a burning heat and alternating like this for a long time, he saw it. Right after the flames roared to life, a series of piercing wails split the air, their voices high-pitched and ululating and waving as they cried out. Philippe uses a racial slur for Native American women that I obviously won't repeat here. Comparing the noise he heard to how he imagines their cries of mourning would sound, he said that despite this, this sound he heard was very distinctly inhuman and closer to his position than the Allah's previous bellows had been. There was a deafening roar that sounded like a thunderclap which Philippe assumed was the Allah. All the noise made Philippe's head spin and he felt very faint. He essentially passed out just after this, but before he did he states very firmly that he saw multiple shadowy human-like figures dancing through the fire. When Philippe regained consciousness, he found himself lying back in his tent. He, the tent, and all his belongings were dry and set up neatly. It was light outside, and he exited his tent to find himself back on the bluff with a bright sun shining overhead. The trees around him were windswept and many were fallen, but the weather overhead showed no indication of the raging storm that swept through the previous night. Philippe said that he could even hear bird song indicating that at least some of the fleeing animals had now returned. He went to the area where he had seen the fire, but he could find no trace of the blaze, because nothing appeared to be burned. He did feel a sort of heaviness in the air, although he was not sure why. Philippe was still a bit shaken, so he took it easy that morning, with a plan to head into the forest later and try to find the valet. However, they came to him. As he was making breakfast, he would look up from his campfire to see a large stag at the edge of the tree line. Riding on the deer was a woman with reddish blonde hair wearing a white dress, staring at him with eyes that he describes as gentle and sharp at the same time. Philippe recognized her as the valet who he had met before. Although he didn't know her name, he slowly approached her and tells us that she and the stag were both perfectly still as he got closer. He had the sudden feeling that this creature was one of the figures that he had seen leaping through the flames the previous night. Of course, Philippe barely gives us any exact dialogue, but he asked the Vila, but he asked the Vila what happened last night. She answered in very vague and almost confusing language, but she repeatedly used the word sick and illness about the Allah. Philippe doesn't give a ton of detail on the exact back and forth of the conversation, but from what he says, it seems like the Allah was very sick, so sick that it went on a mad rampage through the mountains. From all the evidence in the account, the illness almost seems like a form of reptilian rabies. Even though reptiles can't get rabies as far as we know, 
I've done a bit of digging into Hunter theories about this event, and this idea seems to be one of the main ones. The Vilay, like fairies, are known to have several magic-like capabilities, and they had shown their power by creating the fire that Philippe had seen, driving the Allah back and pushing it away from Philippe and the mountain where they probably had their homes. Later in his journals, Philippe mentions that he received some more information from the Samadivi that may indicate that he had something to cure the Allah's sickness, or at least relieve its pain. He wasn't sure about this, but it remains a fascinating possibility. If the Allah's rampage hadn't been stopped, it could very well have hit nearby towns and villages, and we can all imagine what that would have done. Based on Philippe's accounts, it also seems like Alay can communicate telepathically, because even though Philippe's emotions had been influenced by the creatures, in any case, whatever the Valet did must have worked, because Philippe never saw the Allah again, and the rest of his time in the Rudina Mountains was much more peaceful. This is one of the last records of the Allah, and the most intense one. The species might be extinct for all we know, but I doubt it. Alay are clearly intelligent and powerful creatures, and being both reptiles and enormous in size, they probably live for longer than we can imagine. As for the Samadivi, they seem to be doing well. There's lots of forest in the Eastern European landscape, and many of those areas hold for law communities that we know of. There's still a ton of mysteries about both these monsters, though, so over time, I'm sure we'll get to know more and more about them. Most monsters are more mundane than the Alay and Samadivi, in other words, they're more like the creatures that we're used to, relatively speaking. In most cases, cryptid behavior is just a different sort of animal behavior. I'm very into that sort of thing, and so is Heather. And I've mentioned in the past that aquatic monsters were one of her main areas of expertise. Water is a bit of a mixed bag for me. I consider myself lucky that I can swim, because of a surprising amount of people can't, but I'm not a huge fan of it. I also consider myself lucky that I'm not afraid of many things, but deep and open water is one of the few things that can occasionally scare me. This pretty much only goes for dark water that I can't see far in, but that's still not great. So, it's a little ironic that I ended up with someone who thrives in those environments. After coming to the United States, Heather was offered the opportunity to go to Alaska to help with some ongoing research into aquatic cryptids in the area. Naturally, I tagged along and we wound up staying out there for nearly a year. There were a ton of weird and unique animals that lived in the water. And this includes monsters too. I might talk about some of these in other letters, but for right now, I'll just give you some detail on the Powrayuk. I had previously encountered a Bunyip with Heather in Australia, and Powrayuk are similar cryptids in some ways. They are both predatory, aquatic mammals with long furry bodies and strange, usually misunderstood appearances. Legends from different native groups of Alaska speak of the Powrayuk as having two heads, six legs, and horns, but the truth is a little simpler. Powrayuk have long, somewhat serpentine bodies, but they only have one head which resembles that of a fox or a dog, with much smaller nubs for ears. They have four short legs, but they do have small flipper-like body parts behind their back legs, so this is likely where the whole six-leg idea came from. On their backs, Powrayuk have three humps that contain fat and muscle, which is almost certainly where the myth that they have three dorsal fins originates. Their tails end in large, flat, paddle-like shapes that vaguely resembles that fluke of a whale's tail. The whole body of the Powrayuk is covered in white or gray fur, and their mouths have four fangs and plenty of teeth, along with a long, almost chameleon-like tongue. From nose tip to tail tip, Powrayuk are usually about 10 to 12 feet long. Powrayuk are considered by the hunters to be members of the group of animals known as pinnipeds, which includes seals, sea lions, and walruses. Powrayuk are also similar in ecology to these creatures. Powrayuk spend most of their time in the water, mainly hanging around bays and coastlines rather than open ocean. Some of the members in the species even come up rivers and inland every so often. They feed mostly on fish, but they also frequently go after seals, sea lions, 
walruses, and even the porpoises that come off the Alaskan coast sometimes. Pauraiuk are fast, and in the past, they were said to hunt and attack humans, rearing up out of the water to come crashing down on Alaskan natives' kayaks. There's quite a bit that I could say about the time that Heather and I spent in Alaska, because we encountered multiple types of cryptids there. Maybe I'll do a letter on this, because we had a few particularly scary and intense encounters. On one occasion, we got to watch a very interesting interaction between a pair of Pauraiuk. We were with our friend Caroline, who was a member of the group known as the Unangan, or Aelot. Caroline is a two-spirit, a role which is a bit like being transgender. In many native cultures, including this one, some men take on women's roles and behave as they do, and vice versa. For groups where this is a thing, it really isn't socially or politically controversial. These are just normal people who do different things. For Caroline, she was born male but behaves in most ways like a female, and everybody treats her as a woman. Again, for many native groups, this is usually just how things are and isn't very weird or negative at all. Caroline is more like a research-oriented hunter rather than a combat one. Although, like my sister Erica, she can certainly shoot better than most people if need be. She was the one who invited Heather to Alaska to help her with her observations. We went all over Alaska while we were there, but towards the beginning of the time we were in and around the southwestern portion of the state, for most of our time on the coast, there was at least a bit of sea ice, and on this occasion there was some, but not enough to seriously affect our progress. Caroline has a decent-sized boat equipped with a pair of kayaks, so most of the time we used one of these to do our research. To find water cryptids, you obviously must get out on the water. This time, we were out on the boat, hanging around near some ice flows where Caroline had seen a pal Ryuk hunting seals in the past. An ice flow is a floating piece of ice in the water, like a smaller and usually flatter version of an iceberg. Our goal was to tag then gather behavioral data and information on the Pauraiuk. Our hope was that eventually the Pauraiuk might end up and come to that spot once again, where they were to prey on seals. The seals were active, because many of them had just given birth to pups, and the seal babies were just as sleek and cute as you could imagine. Lots of seal species use ice flows and icebergs as a spot to give birth and raise their young, because floating ice is relatively safe from predators. However, there are periods where the pups can be vulnerable as their older relatives go out to get food, and that's when we figured the Pauraiuk might make a move. I don't like watching any animals get killed, especially babies, but nature can be very harsh. At the same time, I also don't like watching any animals starve either, so carnivores, like Pauraiuk, must get their food somewhere. If this Pauraiuk came out of the water to get the seal puppies, then hopefully, we'd be able to tag it while it was on the ice. Caroline had seen it from the boat before, and it hadn't been bothered by the vehicle, so we weren't too concerned about it running away, especially not if it was going to get a meal. When we got out of the water just off the coast a little before dawn, the sea was calm. Floating on the water were several large, flat ice flows. I counted 21 harbor seals lying on the ice, just lounging around and being their usual peaceful roly-poly selves. There was even a pair of bald eagles resting on a nearby flow, which was an unusual sight even though we were close to the shore. We had enough food to fuel and stay out there for a while, so we settled in for quite a while, getting ready for one of those long periods of waiting that often accompanies any hunt, even if it's not for cryptids. We wound up staying out there for four days, shifting position occasionally to follow the seals if they or their ice happened to move. Caroline explained to us that harbor seals can swim within just hours of being born, and they only need the direct care of their mothers for about a month or two. So this group of them would often shift members and locations. On the fourth day, it was getting into the late afternoon, and as the sun was setting lower in the gray overcast sky, we began to see movement in the water on the opposite side of the ice flows from us. The water was quite still, so it wasn't hard to see that something was starting to come towards the surface. 
I wrote down that there were 17 seals that we could see at this point, and most of them didn't seem to notice whatever it was. The movement seemed to circle around twice before starting to approach the ice floe where the seals were. As whatever it was came closer, the seals now began to become aware of it, and a few started making hoarse sparks. One plunged into the water, which set off a chain reaction where all of the seals dove off the ice and into the ocean. If you looked very closely, you were just barely able to see their form swimming away. The initial movement in the water was not tracking after them, though. Instead, it stayed on course for the ice flow. When it arrived, a Powryuk raised its long weasel-like body out of the water and hauled out onto the ice. At first, I couldn't see the cryptid's head or face, and I thought it might have growth on it. But that's because it was holding the upper two-thirds of a dead seal in its mouth. When the Powryuk emerged from the water, it laid the carcass down on the ice and pulled itself around to lay beside it, seeming almost protective. This monster's coat of fur was snow white, so for identification purposes, let's call him white. I'll talk about the usual naming protocol for monsters later, but for now, just so you know, that this was just a personal nickname that I used to distinguish this Powryuk. As we soon found out, White was a male, and there was a very specific reason that he was saving this seal body. At first, we of course believed it was his food. Why isn't he eating it? I asked. He might just not be hungry, Caroline pointed out, which made me feel silly for even asking the question because she was probably right. Do Powryuk make food caches to store their food for later? Heather asked. I've never seen them do that, but it's always possible. But usually, animals that do that bury their food to protect it from scavengers. To leave it out on the ice doesn't seem right, Caroline thought out loud. White closed his eyes and rested for a couple of minutes, and then we saw more motion in the water. By the way it was moving, it looked like to be another Powryuk, which excited us. We were probably going to see an encounter, but we had no idea what form that would take. I suspected that we might see some sort of fight, because food is a common source of conflict between predators. But as soon as the second Powryuk slithered onto the ice, we realized that this was going to be different. This second monster was darker than the first, more of a light gray, so we'll call her Gray to tell her apart from White. When Gray hauled out, White turned to look at her, then moved to nudge the seal carcass towards her with his nose. Gray stopped for a moment, sniffed White's nose, then the seal, and then began to eat the meat. White watched her as she ate, his head raised, small ears standing on end, and tail slowly sliding back and forth across the ice. He looked expectant, like he was waiting for something. The white one is offering the gray one the seal, somebody observed out loud. Are they family? Maybe siblings or a parent and child? I asked, not quite catching on to the situation yet. Uh, I don't think so. Look how the white one is watching the other one. This looks like courtship behavior to me, Caroline said, and then it clicked for me. Then, if other animals are anything to go by, the white one's probably a male, Heather added. We watched as Gray ate her fill of the seal, and then stepped away from the carcass to move closer to White. The pair sniffed at each other's necks and heads for a moment, then each other's hind ends, very much like dogs. Dogs and many other animals obtain a ton of information through scent, and by smelling each other they can figure out many different things. Age, sex, healthiness, reproductive status, and more. In this case, of course, we were all pretty sure that White was checking out the last one. It seemed that he was content with the result because he backed up and gave a sort of hissing rattle and started nudging Gray's neck. She curled away from him and slid into the water, and he followed her. We all looked down into the water where we could see their forms twisting and spinning around each other, doing a dance that was mesmerizing to watch. It reminds me of the so-called sky dances that some birds of prey would do as a courtship custom, except that it was underwater in this case. After a few minutes of swimming together and coming together and apart, the two Powryuk returned to the ice flow and started to eat the rest of the seal together. Now, it was time to tag them. If you've listened to my letter on the Bunyip and Makara, 
you'll be familiar with the practice of using smaller crossbow darts to apply trackers to wildlife, especially aquatic creatures. This is what we were doing here, and with an extremely quick pair of back-to-back -back shots, Caroline darted both gray and white. She got gray first, because she would be more important targets if mating had been successful. Gray and white both dove into the ocean, but Caroline was already reloading, and with a careful aim, she managed to hit White as he swam away. Heather and I spent several more months in Alaska, so we were able to look at some of the tracking data with Caroline and see that White and Gray went their separate ways af after having mated. Like many other carnivores, Powrayuk don't stay with each other for very long, unless it's a mother raising offspring type of thing. After Heather and I left Alaska, we kept in contact with Caroline who told us that shortly after we had gone home, the gray Powrayu had given birth to four pups. I wish I had been around to see them, because I imagine they would have been a lot of fun to watch. I enjoy observing all animals and monsters, but young ones are often more active, so they're interesting to watch. Anyway, that was a cool and rare event, and I'm glad I got to witness it. As a matter of fact, many monster interactions are rare, but eventually you'll probably see some if you spend enough time around these creatures. And sometimes if you're lucky enough, or maybe unlucky enough, the cryptids will wind up coming to you. This was the case for the hunter named Kaori, a Japanese hunter who was active in the 70s. She's still alive, just retired, and I was able to get in touch with her and do a bit of an interview to get a bit more detail on the account I'm about to share with you. When she was an active hunter, Kaori did cases in many different places around the world. For her home and main area of operations was the northern half of Japan. Japan has four main islands and a range of different climates. Much of Honshu, the biggest island, gets very cold with a lot of snow in the winter. Snow can form blizzards, especially in the mountains. And as you know if you've listened to my previous letters, there are certain species of monster that travel along with snowstorm. Namahage are one such cryptid. In appearance, Namahage are humanoids, about 8 or 9 feet tall and covered with dark hair that's usually black or gray in color. They have what's called a mantle, which is the fur or hair around their shoulders, chest, and neck, while the fur on the rest of their bodies is no more than a few inches long. The fur on the mantle was at least a foot long, if not more. The mantle was also lighter in color than the rest of the hair, often either blondish or reddish, this seems to have led to the popular image of Namahage wearing Mino, which are the straw raincoats of historical Japan. Namahage also have bony plates covering their foreheads, noses, cheeks, and chins. These plates are usually bright red or blue, like face colors of the monkeys known as mandrills. If you've ever seen The Lion King, the character Rafiki is a mandrill and Namahage faceplates have similar patterns and colors. Namahage don't have long snouts like mandrills, though, so they almost look like they're wearing masks. Although unlike mandrills, both male and female Namahage have facial plates that are equally colorful. Hunters believe that the mask plates could be a form of identification because each individual Namahage has a slightly different color combination. Otherwise, Namahage hands and feet resembled those of humans and sasquatches. Namahage are rare enough cryptids to begin with, and have become even more so due to the climate change and deforestation around them. They traditionally have lived in high mountain regions and would occasionally descend from these places, sometimes even going so far as to attack and torment humans. The people of the Akita region of Honshu have a long-standing tradition of dressing up as Namahage for an annual New Year's festival, and they'll go around in the Mino straw raincoats that I mentioned earlier. Wearing masks and wielding wooden knives, they often go to scare children into behaving properly. But up until the past couple of hundred years, the actual Namahage species menaced the people of the area. Now these cryptids have been driven back further into the mountains than ever before, and are rarely encountered by humans. But in 1974, such an encounter did occur, and that's where Kauri came in. Mount Chokai is in the Akita Prefecture of Northern Honshu. Kauri 
tells me the mountain is a beautiful place that is both a sacred site and a popular hiking spot. Many areas at the top of Mount Chokai are covered by snow year-round, and in the winter, the weather can get fierce. It is also important for you to know that the mountain is a volcano as well, and even though it's not super volatile, it's super active still. This is important to the account that Kaori shared with me, as you'll see. I've also had an experience of my own with a volcano, so maybe I'll share that with you guys sometime. Anyway... In February of 1974, in the depths of winter, some daring hikers had chosen to climb Mount Chokai, supposedly to challenge themselves with a harsh weather expedition. There are multiple trails that lead up the mountain, but for much of the year they're covered in snow, and they were at this time as well. The hikers had gotten about two-thirds of the way up the mountain when it had begun to snow on them, and they caught a glimpse of at least one enormous inhuman figure coming toward them. They immediately fled the area, but no more than two weeks had gone by before another lone hiker told a friend that he had seen a similar pair of figures, which he swore looked very similar to the Namahage festival costumes he had seen growing up. Unfortunately for this man, his report made him a bit of a local laughingstock, but fortunately for Kaori, this level of attention made her think that something truly was going on, and so she decided to go check things out. It had been years since the Namahage of Mount Chokai had last been sighted, so Kaori took it upon herself to attempt to drive them away from the trails for the safety of any other hikers and climbers who might come by. Kaori couldn't get in touch with the first group of witnesses, but she did manage to question the man who had the most recent encounter. After speaking to him and making some preparations, Kaori headed up Mount Chokai in mid-February. Her aim was to track down the Namahage and find a way to drive them off. All accounts of Namahage make it very clear that they are very regularly hostile towards humans, so having them close to well-traveled trails could be very dangerous for any people using them. However, Kaori couldn't help but notice that something felt off about the whole thing. The Namahage of the area hadn't been sighted that far down the mountain in years, and although it was possible that a lone pair could have pushed further down for whatever reason, Kaori's instincts told her that there was more to the situation. Before she arrived at Mount Chokai, she told me that she passed through a small restaurant nearby where the owner had tried to dissuade her from making the climb on the account of the snow, but of course she pushed on anyways. Through her meeting with the most recent witness, Kaori had a decent idea of the general location where the Namahage had been sighted. The day was an overcast and she used the trails to climb slogging through the snow until she reached her destination. It was an out-of-the-way area, she tells me, that on a good day, it would have taken her a little more than two hours to get to that spot, but because of the thick snow, it took her approximately an extra hour. When she arrived, she looked around for any tracks, but she didn't expect to see any. It apparently snowed at least once between the most recent sighting and her arrival, which would probably have covered most of any prints. I should note that, like many mountains in Japan, Mount Chokai doesn't have a ton of woods covering it. Much of the mountain is just bare expanses of grass or rocks. Kaori figured that the Namahage must have their homes primarily in the rocks and previous reports suggest that they feed primarily on shrubs, birds, rabbits, and fish. Kaori reasoned that maybe the Namahage had been on their way to the water when they were spotted by the hikers. With that in mind, she started heading off the trail towards the river. Picking her way across the rocks past a small, semi-frozen waterfall, Kaori started to walk along the river to head uphill as best as possible. But she hadn't made it far before it began to snow. This was a bit surprising, but the forecast had predicted a small chance of snow, so it wasn't entirely unexpected. There was some sparse tree cover along the riverside which Kaori headed to to take shelter and hopefully wait out the snow. The lines were dead, but it was better than staying out in the open. She made it into the trees as cold wind began to whip up, sending snow up into the air. Luckily, she had a scarf that she was able to use to protect her face, although visibility quickly became very poor. The dead trees provided just a bit of cover, but Kaori was lucky enough to find a decent-sized hollow in the rocks where she could hole up. As you might have guessed, English isn't Kaori's first language, 
so I think she was having a bit of trouble finding the right vocabulary to describe this hollow. But here's what I put together from her description. It was essentially the area beneath a large overhang that was about six or seven feet off the ground and 10 feet wide, jutting out about 20 feet from the surrounding rocks. The front of one side were open to the elements, while the other were shielding them against the wind. Imagine a rectangular room and take out one of the long walls and one of the short walls. From what I gather, that should give you a decent idea of the shape of the hollow. The snow and wind began to intensify dramatically after Kaori entered the hollow, but she guesses that she had only been in there for about 20 minutes or so before she thought she heard something approaching. It sounded like something was crutching through the snow, and she instinctively grabbed her rifle. A huge shadowy figure appeared in front of the hollow and bent over to look inside. Kaori clearly saw the blonde mantle, gray body fur, and deep blue facial plates of a Namahage, and she froze as she and the creature locked eyes. It was the first time she had ever seen one of these creatures in person, and she told me that she was genuinely afraid for her life, and she told me that she was genuinely afraid for her life when she saw this one. However, the Namahage seemed just as surprised to see her, and it took a step back from the mouth of the hollow with a grunt. Kaori was raising her gun when the Namahage lifted a hand and held it out, displaying the jet black skin of its palm. She then tells me that the gesture was almost completely identical to how a human might reach out a hand to calm someone down or tell them to relax. Kaori told me that she didn't know if the creature recognized exactly what a gun was, but even if it didn't, most animals don't like having a big stick being waved or pointed at them. The Namahage obviously sensed Kaori's defensiveness and she very clearly got the impression that, by raising its hand, it was urging her not to attack. Kaori couldn't explain entirely why she did what she did, but she told me that the Namahage's gesture seemed so human and so genuine that she knew that it meant her no harm. She lowered her rifle and stared at the monster for a few moments more, until it slowly began to approach the hollow again. It was slightly hunched over, with its shoulders up by its ears, and Kaori realized that despite its fur, the cryptid was cold. She now put together that it must have been looking for a place to get out of the cold, and because of this realization, she didn't lift her gun up again, although she kept it in her hand just in case. The Namahage stepped into the hollow, but only went a few feet inside before squatting down and sitting with its right side facing Kaori, putting its elbows on its knees and letting its hands hang like many other primates do, including humans. Kaori was amazed because the monster clearly wasn't behaving aggressively whatsoever. This was just another being that was chilly and had no other place to take cover from the cold. Like how predators and prey will drink from the same water hole without conflict, Kaori and the Namahage shared the hollow. They sat for a minute or two, although Kaori says that it felt like hours. The only sound was the wind and the Namahage's deep breathing. I imagine that it was a very strange, intense, and scary magical situation, but it quickly changed when another figure came around the corner and stooped into the hollow. It was another Namahage, this time with a grayer mantle and red facial plates. We'll call this new arrival red and the first one blue. As red entered the hollow, it caught sight of Kaori and froze. There was a tense silence in the hollow, and red looked between blue and Kaori before baring its teeth slowly and starting to give a rumbling growl, crunching further into the hollow. Blue reached out towards Red, but Red gave a howling roar and began moving quickly towards Kaori. She lifted her rifle, but before she could fire, Blue practically tackled Red and shoved it backwards. Red staggered out towards the mouth of the hollow and looked at Blue, seemingly surprised. Kaori said that the two Namahage then began to make fast-paced, chattering growls and huffs and snarls at each other. To Kaori's ear, the sound sounded very much like a rudimentary form of language, like how Sasquatches sometimes communicate. After a bit of back and forth, Red looked at Kaori, gave a low huff, and then sat down across from Blue. It's left side to Kaori. The three of them remained in the cave and although Red would cast a quick glance at Kaori from time to time, she says that she no longer felt like she was in imminent danger from the creature. Every so often, one of the Namahage would scratch themselves grumble 
sigh, yawn with their fanged mouths, or rustle with their long mangled hair. But everything was otherwise peaceful and still inside the hollow. Their breath was heavy and low, and Cowrie did an amusing impression of the sound for me over the phone when I talked to her. At some point, Red scooted over to the closed-in side of the hollow and leaned its back against the wall, and Cowrie said that she saw Blue shift position ever so slightly. To her, it looked like Blue was maybe trying to move between her and Red, although she wasn't sure. Even today, she still doesn't know why Blue would have wanted to protect her, or why Red wasn't more aggressive towards her. Perhaps Red didn't feel threatened by her anymore, or perhaps he just wasn't angry, or hungry. And perhaps Blue just didn't want to cause trouble, especially if it might end either in the Namahaga getting hurt, or whatever. Whatever the case, I don't think anyone likes being out in a blizzard, fur or no fur, so all three of them figured the tension in the hollow was worth it if they weren't getting snow dumped on them. Cowrie checked her watch constantly, and the snowstorm raged on for four hours before finally beginning to taper off. As the snow grew far gentler, the Namahage began to glance out of the hollow more frequently. Finally, when a bit of sunshine began to peek through the clouds, Red started to rise into a squat. It locked eyes with Kaori and snorted to her before turning and heading out of the hollow. Blue also turned and looked at Kaori, and she tells me that she felt like she should wave at it or say something or even bow, maybe to thank it in the traditional Japanese way. But for whatever reason, she was only able to blink and stare, and Blue silently turned away and left the hollow behind its companion. Kaori had relaxed a bit after the first hour or so of the snowstorm, but she had never been anything less than tense during the whole time. She didn't feel like she could stand up to leave for a while longer, and it wasn't until the sun began to get low that she started to make her way back to the trail. Kaori told me that her time in the hollow had been loaded with meaning. It had given her a new perspective on how Namahage behaved, and she realized that although they had been sighted by humans, they didn't necessarily always mean any harm. Despite their historical reputation, even so, Kaori camped out on the mountain for several more days to monitor things and make sure that the trails were safe. Although there were multiple occasions where she thought she caught sight of a Nabahage, it was rare that she actually did. She told me that it might be possible that after Red and Blue had encountered her and seen her as a potential future danger because of her being armed, they might have taken care to stay even further away from the trails. Maybe even somehow warned other Namahage to do the same. It still didn't answer the question of why the Namahage had begun to move further down the mountain, but in the short term, things seemed to be okay. After things had remained calm for a while, Kaori switched locations to higher up the mountain, intending to do some investigation on why the Namahage had pushed down from the peak. It did not take long to get an answer. Remember how I mentioned that Mount Chokai is an active volcano? Well, on March 1st of that year, it erupted. You may be imagining big jets of lava and plumes of smoke and fire, and although it wasn't exactly like that, it was still very dramatic. Kaori didn't see the whole event, but here's what she said happened. At first, there were ground tremors, and very quickly afterwards, a series of explosions went off, sending volcanic ash, steam, stone, and earth bursting out of the ground. Volcanic bombs of molten stone went flying across the mountaintop, and after this initial eruption, gas and mud flows went cascading down from the side, blanketing the area. Kaori said that she was able to flee from the mountain before things got too crazy. This seemed to her to be the explanation for why the Namahage had moved further down the mountain. If her theory was correct, then the monsters had sensed or predicted the oncoming eruption somehow and had fled before it came. But this is just an idea because exactly how the Namahage could have foreseen the volcanic activity is un unknown. In any case, Kaori returned to Mount Chokai a bit later and she never saw a Namahage again, or even got reports of one. The world can be a strange place, and Kaori's story is just an example of this. I've been through my fair share of weirdness as well, so I'll end this letter by talking about one of those experiences. As you may know, I have had many hunts involving Sasquatches, and on one of those, I've had the rare opportunity to watch the brief interaction between a Sasquatch and a group of the little people. 
The name little people is a general term used to refer to many different groups of humanoid monsters that I've come across in North America. They have all sorts of different names among the different native peoples on the continent. Just as the English name suggests the little people resemble smaller versions of Native Americans, usually measuring between two and four feet tall. They just look like smaller versions of regular humans, but they are very different from humans in many different ways. The little people are much like fairies, as they are very elusive and secretive with a variety of abilities that I suppose you might consider are sort of magic. We humans best know the little people for their ability to conceal themselves and for their often standoffish relationship with us. Again, much like fairies, the little people are pranksters, and they will frequently mess with humans for a lack of a better expression. They will cause humans to get lost in the woods, cause them to hallucinate, or rob them of their possessions. And like fairies, the little people can be fickle. They seemingly change their feelings and habits on a dime sometimes without any apparent reason. However, a little differently from most fairies, the little people's mischief can very quickly turn into open violence. On many occasions, the little people will flat out kill people, particularly those who come too close to their grounds or homes. Therefore, on the occasion I'm about to speak of, I played things very cautiously. The background for this one is that I was tracking down a Sasquatch in Kansas. This was early into my career as a solo hunter, after I had gone out from under my mom's wing and started doing more hunts on my own. For this hunt, my goal was just to do some research. I was combining GPS tracking data with on-the-ground observation to get a better picture of Sasquatch travel habits in the area. Kansas is a state that's largely huge stretches of open plains and grassland. So, we hunters were looking into exactly how Sasquatches get through these areas, especially without being spotted by humans. I was following one Sasquatch that had already been tagged, an 8 foot tall adult female with chocolate brown fur. Hunters don't usually give names to monsters because that builds attachment, which can be dangerous. However, especially for research purposes and or when we are dealing with species with multiple known members, we do use numbers or a code name from time to time. I haven't brought these identifications up in these letters partially because we hunters don't always use them impartially because they're not always very important, since in these letters I'm usually only talking about a single member of a species. For the most part, it's the humanoid cryptids that get names, and even then, it's usually the ones that are tagged and are social or active or have different members that we need to tell apart. This is largely since humans are biased towards personalizing things that look and act like us. For instance, the two Sasquatches that I talked about hunting in my very first letter each had code names, as did the mother troll that I saw in Norway. The mama troll's babies all also got tagged and named as well. Other cryptids might just have numbers. Anyway, now that you know all of that, the Sasquatch that I was following on this occasion in Kansas had code named Grace by the hunters who had tagged her. Although, like I said, that's not vital info since she was the only Sasquatch who was there in this story. I had never personally seen Grace myself, so I only knew about her from data that had already been previously collected. However, I could see the GPS tracking information from her tag when I had driven as close to her as possible. I started following her on foot. I didn't necessarily expect to catch up with her, but by being on the ground on her trail, I'd be able to get more clues about her behavior. Where she was eating, sleeping, and stuff like that. There were a few other Sasquatch in the area, all at least several miles away. Was she trying to communicate with them? And if so, how? How was local wildlife reacting to her presence? All of this and more was the type of information I was seeking by tracking her in person. Sasquatches are intelligent and surprisingly stealthy for their size. So even though I had GPS assistance, it was still not easy to find exactly where Grace was. GPS technology, especially back at this time, usually gives a general location, not a super precise one. So she really could have been within several yards of her electronic tracker marker that I was observing. I had also been using my computer to do this observation, and of course I left that behind when I got out of the car. Despite this, when I was on the ground, I was able to find my way to the last location where I had seen her on the computer. She had gone into a good-sized patch of forest, and the last place I had located her was deep into the trees. From there, 
After some time, I was able to pick up her trail and start following it. Tracking Sasquatch, like almost any other animal, can sometimes be very easy and sometimes be the most difficult thing in the world. It depends on the terrain, the weather, the individual, and so on. Grace was a little tough to follow, but judging by the spacing of her footprint, which is called the stride length, I could tell that she was moving at a normal, unhurried pace. My mom had taught me well and I felt confident that I could keep on the trail. As time passed, something suddenly happened that I had never experienced before. It was like I had walked through an invisible curtain. Out of nowhere, I felt the sensation that's very hard to describe, like the woods were somehow different now. But the world suddenly seemed like it was waiting for something. It didn't feel entirely dangerous, but there was an energy that didn't entirely feel safe either. I've told this story before, and the best analogy that I can give is that it felt like I had just come across a large, unfamiliar stray dog. It might be dangerous in attack, but it might also be very friendly and affectionate. It was like the world was anticipating something. The environment felt charged up. Normally, I felt very comfortable in the forest. But now, for whatever reason, I felt like a total outsider. If you don't know, I'm black and native. And the feeling I had at this point was very similar to the one I've sometimes gotten when I'm the only person of color in a room. If that gives you a better picture of things, some of you listening may have experienced this and know firsthand what I mean. I just felt very out of place. Whenever I get a sensation like this, and I'm on a hunt like this, one that's not critically important, I generally know better than to stick around. At this point, I had no idea what was going on. As silly as it might sound, I thought for a second I might be having a heart attack or a stroke, but I quickly put that out of my head because that was very unlikely. But whatever was happening, even if it wasn't monster related, I figured that my best option was just to back out of the area. There was no obvious threat right at the very second, but something about the energy around me felt like things could potentially turn dangerous. I didn't exactly know how, but I didn't want to find out either. As a hunter, you learn quickly to respect your instincts, and if you feel like you might be in immediate risk, research can wait. I turned around to start retracing my steps, but when I completed my 180, I realized that the trees and the light had changed in the blink of an eye. It was like I had been teleported to a completely different part of the woods, and a completely different time. When I entered the trees, it had just been before noon, and now the sunlight looked like it was late afternoon, just before evening. I looked around and realized that I had no idea where I was. To this day, I still don't even know if I had walked anywhere, but I must have because I was in an entirely different place. But I had evidently forgotten all about it because I was in an entirely different location. Obviously, this was the next sign that something was off. I started running through every possibility that I could think of and that was when I thought about the little people I also thought that this could be the work of another more actively sinister species of monster which I've talked about before, but which I won't name here due to the traditional beliefs about it. In either case, I did conclude that I could be in the territory of some cryptid that might intentionally be making me lose my way. Certain monsters like this seem to be able to understand human speech, so I decided to say something. I'm sorry if I've stepped somewhere I'm not welcome. I'm going to leave now. I mean you no harm. Please allow me to return the way I came and leave you in peace, I said. Or at least I tried to say something to that effect. As usual, I'm putting my best recollection of the words that were spoken. I waited for a response of some kind and I thought that maybe, just maybe, I heard something like a whisper. Although I didn't make out any specific words, there was also a light breeze from time to time. So... What I heard could have just been the leaves rustling. In any case, I pulled out my compass and found that it was working, thankfully. I knew that I'd entered the woods from the northeast, so that was the direction I started to head. Even if I didn't find the exact same path I had taken, I would eventually exit the forest if I kept walking that way. After walking for a bit, I came across a big boulder sitting in a more open area of the trees and I froze dead in my tracks when I saw it. Leaning against the large rock was Grace, clearly relaxing and unconcerned. I was about 20 yards away, so I wasn't sure if she saw me. 
What I was a little more concerned about were the small figures that I saw sitting around her feet and climbing on her shoulders. There were about 15 of the little people, and as I said before, they looked just like smaller versions of Plains Indians. Let me note quickly that many native people do use the term Indian to talk about ourselves, especially when referring to our different cultural groups. I generally won't say Indian, given that it's loaded with historical baggage and inaccuracies, but in this case, I'm using it to speak about the general Plains cultures. Because the little people even wore traditional Plains Indian clothing, like breech cloths, buckskins, and moccasins, many of them were sitting or standing on the ground next to Grace, but a few were on her shoulders or her head. I have an older and a younger sister, and between them our mom and their friends, I've seen girls braid each other's hair quite a few times. Braids are also quite popular hairstyle for both black and native people. My sisters and I are both of those and my mom is native, and they all frequently braided their hair and helped each other do so. And as silly as it may sound, I swear that it looked like this is exactly what the little people were doing with the fur of Grace's head and shoulders. I was speechless and stuck in place for a moment, but if Grace had noticed me, she had gave no indication of it that I could see. All the little people on the ground turned to look at me, however, and that's when I noticed a few of them were holding long wooden objects that may have been spears, bows, or axes. I could not see if the things were weapons, or, if so, what kind, but I knew better than to stick around to find out. As I've said many, many accounts of the little people speak of them behaving aggressively, and their arrow and spearheads are said to be poisoned, cursed, and or reinforced with magic which are all reasons why they can kill quite easily. That was one of the first thoughts that I had when this group turned to look at me, and even though I sensed no hostility from them, I knew quickly enough of the stories and accounts to know that their tempers could change very quickly. I didn't run or turn my back on Grace and the little people, but I began to back away slowly. None of them made any move to stop me. When I could no longer see them, that was when I took a deep breath and checked my compass again. It seemed to line up with the position of the sun, so it was probably correct. I felt distinctly unwelcome, but I also figured that maybe I was being played with. This made me worry about being able to get out of the forest, but I didn't really seem to have any other choice but to keep heading northeast. As I headed in that direction, I very distinctly heard laughter, like a rapid, echoing giggle that probably lasted for about four or five seconds. The sound didn't seem to be coming from any direction, so although I instinctively began looking around for the source of it, I quickly realized that was going to be futile. I had my rifle in a sling, and although I felt like taking it out and holding it, I decided that that might not be a great idea. So I just continued to walk away as quickly as possible and vacate the premises. Thankfully, I got out of the tree safely, although I couldn't help but turn around and look back into the woods. I also wondered if the little people could somehow have been helping Grace move around unnoticed, and that's still a question that we capital H hunters haven't been able to fully answer. There are certainly many Sasquatch sightings in areas where there are also little people, but it's still unknown whether there's a bigger connection between the two. It's just another mystery to add to the long, long list. If you've listened to any of the Q&A sections of these letters, you'll know that even though hunters have more answers than most, there's still so much that we just don't know. But that's okay and I think that makes the world a far more interesting place. Anyways, this is getting a bit long, so I'll wrap this letter up here. I have many more, both of my own and other hunter stories that I can share with you. So let me know if you've enjoyed hearing about something other than me for once. Hopefully, this approach wasn't a huge flop. As I said before, I think the next letter or the one after that may just be one long Q&A. So let me know if you guys would like that. And in any case, I hope the new year has been going well for you guys so far. We'll talk more soon. This has been Sam White Owl, signing out.